Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Purified by Fire. I am David Cease, and this is the spiritual coaching show to help you find peace, love, and joy in family and work life sanctifying the world one soul at a time. We are here each and every week to help you grow spiritually, to become successful in this life, and to be a saint for the life after. No matter how broken you may be, God is calling you to greatness that only you can fulfill. So come join us and see how he may be calling you. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is David Cease at uh, the Fairfax Studio, and uh, we're here uh, another day of Purified by Fire. Um, many marriages will have their issues, which could lead to divorce or minimally a bitter marriage with spouses uh, separating either spiritually or physically and leaving bad examples to children and even society itself. More importantly, are married Christians who preach love and yet have difficulty at home. Many couples create a street angel but home devil mentality, which really creates a detrimental impact on their spouse and children. In this episode, we are going to talk about how marriages fall apart and what troubles marriages and how we can fix them um, and how we can improve from them. But before we begin, let's start with a prayer. So we start with um, prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, you bring us together another day with um, Purified by Fire. Today we're going to talk about marriage. Help us to focus on our marriage and our family life. Let those who are struggling be able to strengthen themselves and come to a better life. Only through you, let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that we who have come to know the grace of the Lord's resurrection may through the love of the Spirit ourselves rise to newness of life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so I'd like to talk about marriage. Um, I've been married now over 23 years to my wife, um, and I'm, you know, we've, I can share you some horror stories that we've had. You know, one of the things that all marriages are going to go through is uh, a crisis, a crisis with your spouse. And today, that's what we're going to talk about. And I want to share something that personally happened in our marriage, um, where our, with my marriage, uh, almost fell apart. So um, we've been married for 23 years. So about 10 years ago, so our marriage was about 13 years, maybe 12 years into it. Um, I started really getting um, – I, I, I couldn't get um, a good relationship with my wife. Um, I was fully reverted to the Catholic Church. I had a, a tremendous spiritual life. I went to daily mass. I prayed a lot, um, and I um, you know, was what I thought spiritually there. But at this juncture 10 years ago, um, everything that my wife has said, I just couldn't like stand. It was almost like I just couldn't um, stand it at all. Um, we weren't seeing things eye to eye, and it got to the point where we really could, couldn't communicate. The, we even went to see marriage counseling. Uh, I went to marriage counseling for at least uh, you know, several weeks. I want to say at least six, seven uh, weeks. And um, I will tell you, um, if you want to save your marriage, don't go to a marriage counselor, <laughs> or at least not one that's uh, not a deeply faithful one. But um, the, the, we had some serious issues. And what solved those issues was mainly because I was able to 
focus not my frustration on my wife, but to focus my frustration on me and to change who I really was. And I realized that God was giving me this great test. And this test lasted for, I want to say almost a year, maybe even a little longer. And I realized this was the test to come out of myself. And I did that. And I can say that my marriage is stronger because of it. You know, so my personal sharing of this and what, what I'm going to share with you is in some ways my own personal journey of how I was able to overcome my struggles with my marriage. When you have this deep, you know, anything that your, your wife says, you know, is bothering you or your spouse says or everything they do bothers you or, and those types of things and how you're feeling and how you can overcome them from a spiritual standpoint, especially as Christians. And then become that shining example because ultimately this is called Ductus Exemplo Marriage. So last Friday I talked about being an example, leadership by example. This is being a leadership, um, being leadership by example in your marriage, being a leader to your spouse. I don't care if you're male, uh, the, uh, the, the husband or the wife, being that leader. I've seen great wives uh, being that great leader in a relationship when their husbands are failing and vice versa. So this is the Ductus Exemplo for marriage. So what I'd like to do is really talk about love and selfishness because this is really at the heart of marriages that will either grow or fall apart, all right? It's love versus selfishness. Now, there's all of these misconceptions of what love is um, but uh, the definition of the Catholic Church's love is really important, and, and, and that's what I'm going to be basing off of, all right? So love is really service. When a man and a woman get married and they make their vows, they're really saying, I will be your husband. In other words, I will be the husband for you. I will give you everything of me, everything my sexuality, my time, my money, everything. And conversely, the, the spouse, the uh, wife, will say, I will be your, your wife, and I will give everything of myself. So it's this exchanging of two people of themselves. You know, Scott Hahn had an excellent uh, definition of marriage, and he said, you know, the difference between a marriage and uh, a covenant, he, he does this definition of a covenant and, um, and a contract, he said it's as different as a marriage is the prostitution. You know, marriage is a self-donating process, that's what a covenant is, while a contract is a selfish, it's what it looks for itself. It says, I will give you this if, because you're giving me this, like prostitution. Prostitution basically says, I will give you sex if you give me money. So everyone looks at their own selfish means as opposed to a covenant marriage is really about what I can give into this marriage both as a husband and a spouse. And so when marriages fall apart, it's this polarization of the two, of selfishness and of love. I always tell people the, the opposite of love is not hate. So many people think that the opposite of love is hate, and hate is not. We are actually called to hate sometimes. We're hate to, we have to hate sin. You know, we have to hate the devil. Um, so hate of in itself isn't bad. It's what we hate is bad. You know, if I hate, you know, black people because of their color, well, that's wrong. That's, that's uh, racism. But if I hate sin, that's actually good. So the opposite of love is not hate but really selfishness. Love is one of self-donating. It's really of service. Let's read Galatians 5.13. And, and St. Paul says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love be servants of one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he connects love with service. 
to serve the other person, to serve one another. Well, selfishness says, no, I want people to serve me, okay? I want them to serve me and the world to revolve around me. So this is, this is basically the juncture we're at right now where marriages fail is because we are fighting this definition of love where love has been transformed into the selfish love so about sex or whatever, as opposed to real love is self-donating and then the selfishness. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is why marriages fail. There's actually a pattern, at least that I see, you know, the, the people that I notice uh, eventually who get divorced or who have some serious issues in their marriage life. And it happened to me as well. So what is, um, you know, the first pattern, okay? The first pattern, the first step in this pattern of marriage and fail is, and it, and it, and it kind of wipes away the, uh, most people, is no lasting vision of marriage at the get-go. This is so important to understand. People who get married really don't even know why they're married or what marriage is and what that vision is, all right? We're so conditioned to thinking that marriage is the end-all or be-all, the happily ever after syndrome, I call it, okay, the Cinderella syndrome, where Prince Charming meets Cinderella, they fall in love, and they live happily ever after. Because if we just get married, we're just going to live happily ever after. And it's like, no, that <laughs> marriage is the beginning, not the end. And so when you don't have a vision, and you have, don't have, then you don't have a purpose. If you don't have a purpose for marriage, then there's no root and strength to stick it in when the time gets tough. So without a vision, and that's anything, you know, if you um, run a business, a business has a vision. We will be the best enterprise content management, um, you know, uh, server services uh, all the time. So you have to have a vision. What is that vision? What is marriage supposed to look like? Where are we supposed to go? But if you talk to a lot of young people who get married, and you ask them, well, why are you marrying this person? They'll say, well, he makes me laugh, or she makes me laugh, or she's so beautiful. It's all the selfish stuff. She makes me. He makes me. Okay? Rarely will it be, oh, I have to self-donate to them because I want to be the wife, to serve him and to love him, or to serve and love my wife. So it's important to understand what is the vision of marriage. And we call that a vocation, all right? The, pre, the uh, process to discern your marriage is to really understand what does God want for that? What does that vision want to be? And we'll talk about that vision as part of the solution. So that's step one, usually, is people typically don't have a vision of what marriage is supposed to be, right? Or they, their vision is the Cinderella, happily ever after version of it. The second is the step that occurs is typically after three to five, maybe even seven years. In my case, it was about 17, I'm sorry, 13 years. But usually it's about the third year, third or fourth year, that one of the spouse or both spouses starts getting annoyed about their spouse. That's what happens. You start getting annoyed. You know, those things that you, I, I call this the spaghetti issue. Um, and the reason why I call this spaghetti issue is because my favorite food is spaghetti. You know, I could probably eat it morning, noon, and night. But here's the thing. Even though it's my favorite uh, dish. I don't think I, and even though I could probably eat it morning, noon, uh, morning, noon, and night, I wouldn't be able to do it for a year. I probably couldn't even do it for three months. Because after doing that for uh, three or four months, I would get sick and tired of it. The things that make me enjoy spaghetti would then make me annoyed of it. It's the same thing. When we are with our spouse day after day, week after week, year after year, those things that we might used to like are going to get annoying. 
you know, then those things that you, you know that are annoying will bother us to no end. So that's what happens. They start noticing these things, and those things that used to actually used to have an enjoyment with, oh, he used to make me laugh, are no longer making me laugh. They're actually bothering me because he's making jokes when he should be serious, or he's just a jokester and he can't hold a job, or he's um, you know always serious. He never laughs. Maybe I like that because it gave me stability, but now it's like he won't even go dancing with me. He doesn't even hold my hands, and I want that kind of feeling. Well, those things that used to comfort you now are no longer comforting. They're annoying. So that's the second step. The step one of them um, is to start getting annoyed. The third is that now the spouse becomes selfish. This is where the rubber meets the road now, is that they start becoming selfish. They start thinking like this. They stop listening to their spouse. They start thinking only about how things affect them. That's what they start doing. I I can't believe, you know, he keeps doing that. That is so annoying. I can't believe that. I can't believe he did that or she did that. All right? You start thinking about how they are always doing things to annoy you why they fall short because they're not thinking about themselves in the context of maybe they also fall short, okay? When I was having problems with my wife, I was thinking about all the things why she was falling short and not about why I was falling short, why I have issues as well, why I cause some of those issues. But the selfish mode says, well, I must be perfect. It's they're the problem. Okay, that's what it is. That's what selfishness does. I'm not the problem. They're the problem. And you start taking out, you know, this, this, uh, this idea that they're the problem. A long time ago, uh, probably 15 years ago, we were friends with a couple. And um, I was, uh, we went out for a long walk. And this couple came up, and I was first talking to the wife. The husband was only probably about 10 feet in front of me. And the wife said, talking to, so the husband is talking to my wife. I'm talking to the wife of, of this couple. And the wife says, my husband's going to leave me. And I said, whoa, your husband's going to leave you. And they said, yeah, he's never there. He's always at work. He doesn't care about my children. He doesn't, or our, our children. He doesn't care about me because he's never there. I can't depend on him. So I looked at her in the eye, and I said to her, did you ever think about going to confession? And she looked at me like I had two heads, that she didn't understand that, that he was the problem, not her. So then, half hour later, I'm talking to the husband, and she's talking to my wife. And the husband says, you know, she doesn't understand me. She has no idea. She doesn't understand me at all. I, I, I work all the time, but she doesn't appreciate me. You know, I, I, again, it was her fault. So I looked at him again, and I said, did you think about going to confession? And he looks at me as if I had five heads on my uh, shoulder, and he says, don't you understand? She's the problem, not me. That's what happens. The selfish mode starts saying, you're the problem, you're the problem. But it's not me is the problem. Not even... I could be a catalyst to solve this problem. So it gets the selfishness becomes a hunker down mentality. So that's step three in this process of, of a failed marriage. Step four, which is the next elevation, is the spouses start imposing change on the others. So once they recognize all the shortcomings of their spouse, they now start imposing the changes that they want, whether um, passive aggressively or aggressively, they start imposing it. You know, I can't tolerate you doing this. I need you need to change. You need to change because I can't tolerate this. You know, and that's what happens. So slowly, they 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 stop listening to their spouse. All they want to do is start saying, "Okay, how do I solve your problem? 
you're the problem. You need to do this. And so that's what they do. They objectively um, impose the change on them. They find every reason why the spouse is bad. You can never find anything good about the spouse. And this is the longest cycle. This is where the drug, the drawn out period of spouses falling apart occurs. The cycle repeats and is drawn out over and over and over again. Until something has to give, <clears throat> which is the next step. The spouse realizing they can no longer change the other person will then find another person or, or another outlet for satisfaction and meaning in life. So in other words, when they start trying to hit this you know, person and try to change them, they realize they can't change them. They realize that their marriage isn't doing well because I can't change this person and everything that this person does is annoying. Then they start finding another outlet that will be more, quote, fulfilling or satisfying or give them meaning in life. And this is what I call falling out of love. This is when everyone says, I, I've fallen out of love. That's At least that's what the world will say. You've fallen out of love because he doesn't make you happy anymore. He doesn't make you love anymore. So I'm falling out of love. And then, which is, the, this fifth step is really, really the death blow. Okay? Once you start find, taking your heart and giving it to something or someone else, that's really the death blow of marriage, which leads to the second step, which is spouses leaving either emotionally, spiritually, and physically, which then leads to, I don't love you anymore, or that's what they think. So those are the six steps of a marriage, fail, marriage failure cause, and you can stop it at any time through love, through self-sacrifice through what I would call changing yourself so that you can lead and take yourself out of this cycle, this process. Someone has to do it. Someone, one of the spouse has to take that leadership to get out of that rut, okay? Um, and lead that, 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 that marriage out of that rut. So if they don't do that, then what typically happens is a person will seek another marriage. And because they really haven't solved the issue that it's really themselves and that love is really about self-donating, this whole process will repeat itself. If you statistically look at divorce rates, you'll find that people who marry the second and third time, you know, I believe first time uh, divorce is roughly around 50%. Second time, I believe is like 70%. And then third time is almost like 90% divorce. So it certainly isn't the other person. So that's what the cycle of, you know, or I should say cycle, it's the failed marriage pattern occurs, okay? And all of us can look at their marriage and say, you know, all marriages are perfect. But when it starts following these patterns in a very concrete way, then, and no one's taking the leadership to pull themselves out of it, okay, it, the pattern will continue until the death blow occurs and the marriage fails and, you know, and divorce really happens. And step number five is the death blow because once you start giving your heart to someone or something else, then there's nothing there. So what are the steps I can do to do lead by example? So I want to emphasize this is that so the spouse has to take leadership by example. You have to take it. That's the point that's important to say, I am seeking love, true love, self-serving, um, no, sorry, uh, a service love to serve my spouse. No matter how I feel that I'm going to serve my spouse, no matter if he annoys me, no matter what. So we'll talk about the first step to take. And the first step to take is the choice to become a leader of holiness and change. Yes, 
take that leadership of holiness and change in oneself. Not your spouse, but oneself. You change and seek that holiness. Seeking the virtues, all of that. So in other words, you're going to make a commitment to say, I'm going to look inside and stop thinking you can change your spouse. Instead of, stop, instead of saying, you know what, I'm, going to, I'm here to change my spouse, I'm going to say, I can change myself. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to become the holy example to my spouse and to my children. Okay? So that's what you want to do. You want to make that. Okay? Be the first to do everything, to forgive. You know, I don't know how many people who don't want to say, I'm sorry. But you know what? Saying you're sorry to your spouse is the most powerful thing you can ever do. Going to confession. Be the first to go to confession. Honey, I'm going to go to confession. Okay? Showing mercy. Being the first. Not only to show mercy, but to also ask for mercy. The most important thing, being first, is really doing it. So asking for forgiveness. You know, saying to your spouse, I'm, you know, if you got angry and you say, I'm sorry, I, I was angry, even if you're right, it doesn't matter. All right? I remember one time I asked, uh, uh, you know, I, I was talking to a uh, father one time and I said, did you ever say you're sorry to your son? And he looked at me and he goes, no, I would never say sorry to my son. I said, why not? And he goes, because I'm his father. I said, well, how are you going to teach him about forgiveness if you're not going to be willing to ask for forgiveness when he clearly knows you've done the wrong thing? That's the thing. We all make mistakes. We all have faults. I get angry. But do we teach our children pride by not saying, I'm sorry? Or do we teach them about forgiveness by saying, I'm sorry? I ask for, for, I ask for forgiveness for my children and to my wife. Even if I'm right, you know, you know. So if I get all riled up and angry and start yelling at my wife, I will stop and I'll say, maybe not at that moment, but you know, later on, I will say, "Honey, I am so sorry for yelling at you. I didn't mean to do that. Will you forgive me?" That's Dr. Exemplo. That's how you do it. You look inside yourself what you've done wrong, not what, you know, whether I'm right or wrong or anything like that. It's what have I done wrong? So by being this leadership of holiness and change, an example, you now become a catalyst of change to help your spouse. That's what you're doing. You're beginning to change and to get out of that cycle. By making that choice to say, I, I want to be a leader of holiness and change. To look inside myself. That's step one. The next thing is, and maybe some of you already know it or whatever, but finding purpose in marriage. I'll never forget that, you know, if I didn't know what the purpose of marriage was, and I know if I went through about that marriage crisis 10 years ago, my 13th year of marriage, I would have divorced. I'll be quite frank with you. I would have divorced probably when I had my second child because, you know, having children is difficult. And there's great joy to it. But because I read this really great apostolic exhortation by Pope John Paul II called Familias Consorto, I understood two things. One is what love is, how to grow in love, and what the vision of marriage is. I would read that. I would make it a staple for every you know, um, uh, marriage um, uh, counseling that's out there. But familiar is consorto. It teaches you. Why are you getting married? And what is it? He talks about, John Paul II talks about the Holy Trinity being the model of the family. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Mother, Father, Children. He talks about that when two spouses come together and provide a communion of love, just like the Eucharist, a communion of love, through children, we build the community of love. So a family is a community of love. 
But that community of love is based off of the communion of love between a man and a woman. He talks about service, one's vocation to serve. He talks about that the mission and purpose of marriage is holiness and to grow in love. We know a vocation like the priesthood and the religious life, we look at a religious and say, boy, they must be holy, or they're striving for holiness. Or we see a priest, and we say, he must be striving for holiness, or he must be a holy priest. Well, you know what? We as married people, we should be able to say to a married couple, he must be or she must be striving for holiness. Because the vocation of the marriage life is no different than the vocation of a religious life and the priesthood. They're both vocations. But because we've been psychologically malinformed, we think that marriage is happily ever after. The Cinderella story. But it's a vocation. A vocation of love and holiness. In fact, I would even say it's a better vocation to become holy through marriage and in love, I've, I, you know, uh, I talked to a couple of my Franciscan uh, friends, they're Franciscan fr- uh, brothers as well as, as priests, and they're always mesmerized. And they say, how can you, you know, be so loving to your six kids and to a spouse? I see the concrete growth of my love through the trials, the suffering, and the service that I do for my family. Religious can't do that. Priests, diocesan priests, yeah, maybe because they have to work with their parish. But it is only in the family, in the love and the spouse. So finding the purpose of marriage, knowing it's a vocation to holiness and growth. Okay? Love doesn't grow unless it's tested. Just like muscle. Love is a muscle. Holiness is a muscle. You know, you, you run a mile, you can, you know, one day... You go run on two miles, three miles, four miles. You have one child, your love is this much. You know, you have two, it's going to grow. Three, a lot of people think that love is like a piece of bread with children. They think it's like, well, if I have one child, then I can give them half. And if I have two, then I, can, I have to split it in thirds. And if I have four, I'm going to split it in quarters. No, love is a muscle. Every one of those children, when you love them, you will grow. And now... I can tell you, I, I would love to have more children than just six. So the point to understand is finding purpose. And that will give you the drive to help you suffer through it. Because that suffer is no longer is agony, is true love. It's knowing that you're suffering with a purpose. The next step is confession. I cannot emphasize how important confession is to transforming a person's life. Okay, Just objectively speaking, I'm not even talking about the sacramental grace, but just objectively speaking, allowing someone to hear your problems, pains, faults, sins that you've done is great. I tell people, people spend thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to a psychiatrist who at the end really doesn't even help you. Okay? They will literally spend all this money when you can go to a priest for free. Absolutely free. It's a psychological, you know, people know even through psychology that when someone does something wrong, Talking to another person gives them more peace, gives them an ease instead of bottling it up. Because once we bottle it up and we do more, we're like a pressure cooker that the steam, the lid is tightened and the steam keeps boiling and we're going to explode. So objectively speaking, going and talking to another person is great. Understanding that now you add to the level that you put grace on top of it. Grace on top of it. Oh, that transforms the soul. 
And then hearing the words, you are forgiven. Objectively speaking, people who commit a sin or something wrong, and they know that it's eating their conscience away, they want to hear words, comforting words like, you're forgiven. You're okay. You're healed. That's what happens. Objectively speaking, confession holds a person accountable. Okay? You keep repeating a sin over and over and over again, and it's okay to do that. I mean, I mean when I say, okay, it's, you know, the confession can keep healing you. But it will change you if you say, you know what, I've got to find better ways of changing this. Because faults aren't going to be corrected just because you wish it. It's going to be corrected because there's going to be a priest to hold you accountable. The, so confession really, really helps you. It helps you another way, too, is that you're looking inside of yourself and changing who you are as opposed to pointing your fingers at everyone else. Now, that's if you make a good confession. So how do you make a good confession? You know, <clears throat> I'm not going to go over the, the basic, you know, uh, um, you know, RCIA basic wall. As soon as you go in, you say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was a week ago. The vocation I'm changing is that everyone should know that, okay? Everyone knows that maybe they should review the Ten Commandments and say, where have I failed, you know? But the way you truly change yourself is that if you're going in the confession saying, forgive me, Father, um, I've committed a sin by yelling at my wife very angrily, but she deserved it. It was her fault. She was wrong. And that's not a good confession. In fact, that is the same issue that caused original sin. If you look at Adam and Eve, they committed original sin by eating the fruit of the true knowledge of good and evil. That knowledge of good and evil of in itself was bad. But then God says, hey, Adam, where are you? Notice God doesn't accuse him right there and say, Adam, you're cursed because you ate the knowledge of good and evil. He says, where are you? Almost implying that, you know what? If you can confess your sins, I'll forgive you. But what does Adam say? Adam says, Oh, I was naked, so I hid in the bush. Then God says, who told you you were naked? A leading question. Again, second opportunity <clears throat> to say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. But no, what does he say then? I ate, the, the God says, did you eat the knowledge of good and evil? And he says, I did, because the, of the woman you a.k.a. you're the problem God because you gave me this woman who told me to eat it. He blamed God, blamed the woman for his own actions instead of saying, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. These are my actions. It doesn't matter whether you were right or wrong or anything like that. If you were angry and you were not justifiably angry at that moment in time, that's wrong. So you have to go down and look at your own sin. So when I do that, all I do is focus on my sins, my sins only. I failed. This is what I did. Okay? So <clears throat> that's what makes a really good transformative confession. You know, that's what you do. Now, that's for the false. Now, we have minor false and we have great big false, like mortal sin, which we need to know, you know, do, you know, express. But then there's spiritual direction that can help out to get us to the next level. So confession, you know, it's so important, um, you know, and those things. So that's one of the key things. The fourth key element to, to do start with leadership by example for your spouse. <clears throat> and this is important, loving yourself. Now, people say, wow, loving yourself, you know, that, that must be bad. I'm not talking about self-love. I'm talking about truly loving yourself, 
excuse me, based off of the idea that you're a child of God. Self-esteem. Not based off of because you're pretty or because you're smart or because you can do great athletics or because you're a wealthy woman. They're all going to fade. That's what the Egyptians taught us. The Egyptians taught us that, you know, all that stuff, it's going to fade. You're going to, you're going to be a decomposing, rotting body, okay? A hundred years from now, we're all going to be decomposing, rotting body, six feet under, okay? Someone else is going to have that money. Someone else is going to have that power. But what no one can take away except for ourselves is that we're a child of God. We are worth more than the whole universe. Why? Because Jesus died for us, who is God. And now, just a little bit of his blood is worth five to- billion times more than this universe. Yet he shed more than just a little drop. That's where your love, loving yourself comes along. So Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. We've read about that in Gal- uh, Galatians. So you can't give what you don't have. If you don't love yourself, then how do you love others? You can't. So loving yourself on the idea that God loves you as a child of God, then nothing will bother you. It really won't. You know, running a business, having teenage kids, you know, if you have teenage kids, they will slight you. They will say bad things about you. They'll do lots of things to you, okay? Give you attitudes. And there are times where you just want to, like, give an attitude back. But to avoid that, you, it, you have to have better self-esteem. So what? My, my um, daughter does this. So what? My, my wife doesn't appreciate me. I'm a child of God. I don't care what, what they think of me because I'm a child of God. So you're being, having good self-esteem allows you to not care about what people think about you because what matters the most is what God thinks about you. That's the most important thing. And so when your spouse says, you know, hey, you didn't take out the garbage yesterday, blah, 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 and all this other negative things about why you failed in other things, you just walk away saying, okay, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I'll try next time harder and better with good sincerity. You will, but it's not going to bother you because you're not a shell. You're not this fragile shell that cannot be, that cannot withstand some true facts. I did fail. You can just accept it and move on and say, you know, honey, you're right. I will try to do better next time. I'm sorry. and truly mean it. And not feel like, you're hurting me, the self-esteem, it doesn't feel good. That's what good self-esteem does to you. But basing it off of that you're a child of God, because that is something no one can take away except for yourself. The next is love God above all things. It goes back to you can't give what you don't have. So God is the conduit. God is the source of all love. If you think about it, if you do any study about energy, especially fossil fuel, we'll talk about fossil fuel, for example, um, the source of energy that the fossil fossil fuel, like gasoline and coal comes from, ultimately, is the sun. I mean, at the end of the day, that's where it comes from, because most of the fossil fuels that we run on came from, you know, some form of plant life, ferns or whatever. Um, and so where did they get their energy from? The sun. And the sun created those plants, you know, sustained those plants. The plants died. They became fossil fuel. But that's where it is. But if there was no sun, there would be no plants, no plants, no fossil fuel. So... That's what God is. God is the source of all our love. And when we have that tight relationship with God, we can then be that fossil fuel for other people, to our spouse. That's why 
you need to love God above all things because he's the source of love that we can give to others. Not only does he, is he a source of love, but he's also the example of love. Okay? We, a lot of times we have to learn by example. Okay? I, at least I do. The love relationship with God, his forgiveness, his justice, his listening to you, will far exceed anyone here on earth. And so that becomes a great example for you to have to go and have the same to your spouse. When God forgives your sins, when you go to confession, so you should do to your spouse. How many times? Even 70 times 70. That's what we got to do. So love God. Have that loving relationship. I had a, a talk with um, a person just the other day. And we were talking about, you know, he, he's, he's a Catholic, but he's kind of fallen away. And he was kind of talking about, like, he says, you know, I have a tough issue because he had a troubling life. His mother wasn't the greatest. And he says, you know, I have a tough time with honoring thy mother and thy father because that's my biggest issue that I have. And I looked at him and I said, when was the last time I go to Mass? He goes, oh, I haven't gone to Mass for a long time. I said, well, that's breaking the third commandment. I said, have you used God's name in vain? Oh, yeah, yeah, I do it kind of often. I said, that's breaking the second commandment. I said, you know, your, your biggest issue isn't um, the, the honoring thy mother and thy father. Your biggest issue really is you're rejecting God because you can't love your mother. You can't even honor your parents if you dishonor God. You don't even know what it means. You have, you're trying to give something you don't even have. So you have to go back to the basics, which is loving God. And that will be the source of love, the example of love, that will be there for you to love and honor other people. Lastly, loving God is because, you know what? God will never fail you. He won't. He will never fail you. But you know what? My wife will. My children will. My job will. World, the world will. They will fail me. But you know what? It won't make me disturbed or anything like that because God will never fail me, and I enjoy that. But your wives will, or your, your husband will. So that's number five. Number six, and I'm going to say this because I find more marriages having problems with this, and it's control. Control, whether voluntary or involuntary. Control is the biggest issue in marriage. We talked about that as one of the pitfalls. I'll talk about uh, you know, the story of Martha and Mary in the Bible. So Jesus visits Martha and Mary, and Martha says to Jesus, Jesus, you know, why don't you tell Mary you know, basically she's, she's saying, I'm doing all this work. Could you tell Mary to help me out? What is she doing? She's trying to control Mary using Jesus as the instrument. Okay? You know, a lot of people say, oh, that's the religious glory versus the, the, uh, the, the worldly life. No, that's, that's not really what it – I mean, it could be part of it, but, but really, let's take it for face value. Okay? What is she really trying to do? She's trying to control her sister, Mary, through Jesus. But face value, that's what she's trying to do. And then the second thing she's trying to say is, oh, Jesus, look how great I am because I'm doing all the work. And, of course, Mary isn't. So can you tell her to do all this work instead of gazing at you and watching you? And what does Jesus say? Martha. Mary has chosen the better part. What's the better part? Yes, contemplating Christ. I understand that. That's a, you, know, you can have that spiritual meaning, and I agree with that. But also from a face value standpoint is, you know, Mary, basically you're trying to control the situation here. And she's letting God enter her life. That's what it is. 
So control, it needs to be <laughs> managed. I'm not going to use the word control. Um, and I will say control, even with good intentions, become bad with control. I've seen so many families that through control, even with the best intentions, I want to have my, my, you know, everyone wants to make their house clean and cleanly and everything else. Who doesn't want to? But when it controls you and obsesses you, it can alienate a lot of people. And it's controlling you. Control ultimately then controls you. That's what happens. So, and that is what ultimately, I think, is one of the biggest reasons why, you know, marriages fail. When I was on the verge of, of uh, when we had marital issues, I was trying to control my wife. It was this power play, this struggle. My wife doing something to me, I was doing something to her, and vice versa. Okay? I didn't like how she was controlling uh, the children. So I had to get into control. It's this control going back and forth rather than serving. So control eats the spouse that wants to control and makes all people around disgruntled. That's basically what control does. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't shoot for orderliness and everything else, but when control disrupts our peace, that's where it, you have to draw the line. The next is we have to find role models of service and obedience and love. I love using couple. The first is a, a great one is the love relationship between Jesus and the church. See, Paul writes about this. Okay? He says, husbands and wives be subject to each other. And then he breaks it down and says, man, a woman, a wife should be submissive like Christ, like the church is submissive to Christ. And then he says, and man, you need to serve the church as Christ served the church. Now, we can argue the point of all of these things like, you know, that means women should be submissive of their husband and, and everything they do. And I don't think that's a misinterpretation there. And this is where I find a lot of marriages falling apart is that husbands try to dominate their, their, their wives at a materialistic life. I had a, uh, a friend of mine, and uh, she got married to a Protestant. They were Protestant. And, he, and they were going from one job to another job to another job, and they were moving from one place to another. And he kept saying, telling his wife, oh, you know what? Uh, God is calling me to be this. God is calling me to do this. God is calling me to do this. And she would follow. Now, what he was really doing was he was following his own passions and he was getting tired of each job and going somewhere else. But he was using religion to keep changing his job. Do you think that's right? So, you know, sometimes wives are better than at material things than husbands are. You know, my wife is pretty smart. A lot smaller than I am. But does that relinquish my ability to be a leader? Is that what it is? No, it doesn't. Because just like Jesus, husbands need to serve. The upper room is the model of what it means to be Christ-like. You know, Jesus died. Husbands, are we going to die for our spouse? He served them. He washed the feet of his church. Did he lord it over the church? No, he didn't lord it over. Jesus preached and taught the truth and led by example. Husbands, do we do that? Jesus allowed people to choose their ways. He didn't force them. He allowed them to do, make their own choice. Because that's what love does. He served. If you read the Bible, a lot of things he did, he healed. He freed. He taught. He fed people. He casted out demons. Lording over your spouse, a husband's uh, doing it, is not what it's all about. It's about leading. 
is about serving, healing, feeding. Okay? That's what it's all about. Husbands can heal a relationship so much they can. When I got out of my funk and started thinking about how I could add value to the relationship, I brought laughter into our family again. I brought, you know, um, joy. And my, uh, the other day, my wife got really angry at, at my son, and he started yelling. And I went over there, and I kind of laughed a little, because it was actually a funny scene, and my wife started laughing, and my son started laughing. And finally, I looked at my son, and I said, you know, Joshua, your mother's right. This is what you need to do. Diffuse the whole situation. That's what it is to serve, to heal. So the transformative power of changing yourself to lead, to be an example to your spouse will make them change. Now, here are some enemies that will fight you and, and, and how they're going to fight you. Okay? We talked about the three enemies of the soul. So we'll talk about the devil because he, he kind of goes in pretty hard. So the devil is the first enemy, and he uses two things. He always conjures up the past. And he gives you this feeling of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We call it FUD, right? We talked about that with the devil. But he does that by conjuring up the past. That's what he does. You know, when you go to confession, God actually forgives you, and when he does, he forgets it. Doesn't even know that it exists. Now, I'm not saying that we can do that in the beginning, but we've got to be able to do that. We've got to be able to actually fight Satan and say, I don't want you to bring up that past event. So how does he do that? Um, he might uh, throw uh, the idea that you're a doormat mentality. You're a doormat. Okay? He might say, you know, hey... Um, I'm getting tired. You're getting tired of doing this. You keep doing the same thing, and this person is never going to change. Look, you did the, he did the same thing over and over again. Okay? So here's a couple of things that you can do. When the devil says to you, he keeps doing the same problem over and over again, you remember and you say, how many times am I supposed to forgive them? 70 times 70. Okay? When he starts conjuring up you know, things from the past, you focus on the now and moving forward. You tell Satan, look, I'm not worrying about the past. I'm worrying about what I need to do now. It's called living for the now and forward, how I can be good and moving forward. Okay? When, you, when he starts saying, oh, you're tired of doing this, you practice the virtue of patient endurance. And you lead yourself to hope by saying, my example is going to work because i become a shining example to others and that including your spouse. The other thing is stop thinking about bad things about your spouse. The way that you do it, the way I did it, is sit down and write all the good things that your spouse brings. My wife once said um, a little thing that I really love. She said, you know, she said, be appreciative of what they can do for you. So write down all the good things. Just sit down. And if, even if you can only think of one, start with that one. And then notice it in other people. Okay? The next is enemy of the, of the world. The worst thing that they're going to say is religion doesn't help you. Only you can help yourself. And that, and that means having a um, you know, divorce or remarriage or you need better money or whatever. Religion and confession and the Eucharist and the doctrines, spirituality, all of those help out. That's what's going to save you. That's what's going to help you. But the world's going to say, no, 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 no. You know, why are you wasting your time on confession? Why are you wasting your time in, in praying? 
That's what the scripture has to say. You need to take action. You need to do this. Okay? So that's what the world is going to say. It's going to convince you. And then, of course, the enemy of the self. And really, that's really, really important because the, the flesh is going to be annoyed at different things that it does. And you have to use your passions and know what the vision of marriage is to control that flesh. To say, you know, this is annoying, but I'm going to overcome it. And it will. Okay? You'll be able to overcome it. And all those annoying things won't bother you anymore. It really won't. It will. But in the beginning, it will. Because you're trying to wrench yourself into saying this is okay. So in the beginning, it's going to hurt. But after a while, it's perfectly fine. Just like a runner. When you first run, it hurts. You know, I, you know when you start running that mile, you never ran a mile for a long time, you're going to feel aches and pains. But after a while, it gets better. It really does. So you have to use this vision of marriage to help control your passions to say, the greater good is this marriage that I love. And even though my flesh is saying, oh, he's doing something annoying, he left the dishes out, or she, you know, she keeps nagging me, you will overcome it. And you'll see the light. And lastly, find a spiritual director or a coach to help you navigate the soul and help you move from there. Now, you would prefer a spiritual director, but I know sometimes finding a spiritual director is difficult. So one of the missions of Purified by Fire is to be a spiritual coach to help people with that. So what I'd like to do now is end it. We're at the hour um, and talk about – actually, before I do that, um, I would like to talk about St. Monica. She was a shining example. Her husband beat her. Her husband uh, committed adultery. He did a lot of bad things to her. But at the end of the day, her example, and she was an alcoholic. She transformed herself from being an alcoholic to be this great saint to transform her husband, who would be baptized on her in his deathbed, as well as convert her son, who would be one of the greatest um, theologians and saints of our, of our time. So it works. Transforming yourself, become holy, and leading by example. example. Dr. Exemplo, Marriage Life. So let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this great gift, vocation called the marriage life, that we can become holy, that we can become the greatest saints because of all the trials you give us, the opportunities for us to grow in holiness and love, let us use it for that way. Let us never be selfish. And if we fall, let us go back to confession. Dear Lord, Father, you help us all the time. You are the role model of a true uh, husband, Father. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Purified by Fire. Please visit us at purifiedbyfire.com. Like us at Instagram and Facebook at purified.fire sanctifying the world one soul at a time. Tell me, can you hear me now? Can you hear me crying out? Like an animal out in the wild. I shout your name into the night. Tell me, can you feel it too? Feel the love just like I do. Only you can make it right I shout your name into the night And we call it for you, we call it for you And we call it for you, we call it for you And we call it for you, we call it for you 
We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.